You are now entering the Honeysuckle Podcast. Today we are speaking with Tremaine Wright, the chair of the Cannabis Control Board, New York State Office of Cannabis Management. We were just on the Washington Heights. Um, you guys had the like community meeting. Ah, yes. yes. So we popped on to hear that. Yeah, it's just interesting all the complicated challenges and nuances to everything. I was going to say, I think that um, it's going to be really important for us to make sure that we have a really clear message that we send out to um, community. And when we're talking about it, because we are, we have to help frame the conversation so that, because there's a lot of moving parts and there are lots of personal interests that come into this space. And so we want to keep people focused on sort of what we can accomplish at, um, as an agency and the direction that we're moving in. So I think it's going to be really important for us to consistently have face-to-face conversations with the um, community. Yeah, also just all the different backgrounds, like in levels of participation that people have been engaged in in the legacy, you know, from small operations to big ones and, yeah, yeah. you know different levels of legality and everything I think are, are, you know, obviously complex. Well, you know what I'm going to say, I think that we've got a, that's also part of the messaging that I think the um, OCM has to be clear on. It's not actually that complex. There is no gray market in New York. It, if anyone is operating and selling cannabis in New York state at this time, it is not it is not um, under the medical license, it's not legal. Um, so we've got to get clear that we're, what we're talking about and help people to understand what we need them to do is to prepare themselves so that they can obtain licensing and come into the regulated market. Because really what we want to make sure is that we're not seeing consistent streams of unregulated, untested products that really are not it's just not safe. So we want to make sure that we're really controlling the marketplace so that our consumers can trust what they're buying and what they're getting their hands on and that they know that when they pick it up, they can read a label and they know exactly what they're getting. So it's it's twofold. We need consumers to be um, educated and to know that they can trust it. And then we also need to know that our providers, um, our businesses, are folks who are operating in the um, in good faith and that they're building great relationships. Yeah. Well, yeah. and oh, one sec, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and it's interesting because a lot of the legacy brands in New York seem to be getting a lot of attention. Um, they are. <laughs> And you know what? We understand that New York State has a robust market that we're asking people to move out of that space and into this regulated space. But it's going to take us building a partnership. This is going to be about trust. It's about relationships. It's about them knowing and understanding that as we're building a cannabis industry, a healthy market has a space for everybody. And so long as we stand true and hold ourselves accountable to that premise, I think that we'll be able to create the marketplace and the ecosystem that allows people to know and understand that there's a space for them in it. 100%. And that that actually brings me to a question that, you know, I had sort of half formed before I listened to your talk at the community board, but now it it makes me think about it in a sort of different way. Um, the whole concept of the micro business is really starting to grow New York's craft cannabis. Yes. But at the same time, there's this push not to have too much vertical integration. And you know, we also have this presence from the MSOs that is in New York right now. We have the Cure Leafs, we have the Ianthus Sativas. Um, and so, you know, I, I wonder with the micro business licensing, 
how exactly is that going to work in in terms of the balance like how how do we go from you know that whole cycle of craft to industry to craft again so we are support very supportive of the craft market um we're very supportive of new entrants into the market having an opportunity to um, do everything from seed to sale. And that's what the micro business is allowing them to do. And we do want them to have the opportunity to grow and expand their business. Um, we don't want to put artificial limitations on their growth, but we do believe that that fits in very well to the model and the outlook as we start to think about what does this industry look like in two, five, or 10 years, because they have got to have the ability to, to um, scale their businesses. And we think that that's exactly what it's going to do. So we're looking at models very much like our wine industry or our beer industry here in New York and what it's been, the supports that's been necessary for them to manage and to be successful in spite of extremely large multinational um, wine companies operating in this space, as well as beer companies. Um, so when we think about it that way, that's what we're trying to make sure we carve out for New York businesses. Our existing um, medical marijuana companies, their MSOs, they have a plan under the MRTA for how they too can expand their presence in New York state, but it's limited. Um, they're not allowed to have more than three dispensaries, even um, under the adult use market. But the timing for the when and the how will be left to um, our agency and the board to make a determination on when that makes sense for us to allow them into this space. Uh, and I just think that we, we're in a place where we're examining what's going on. And we've got to come up with a system that balances the competing needs. But I do think that the micro business is going to be a real game changer for us here in New York. And it'll give a lot of our budding entrepreneurs an opportunity to carve out space for themselves, to scale their businesses, and to be able to continue to exist and to thrive even when we go national. Because I do think, and I really do believe that we will see um, cannabis legalized nationally in the near future. We do too. Mm -hmm. Do you think then that, that the New York craft brands would be able to grow to national brands? Um, I think that we're going to have to make sure that our regulation allows for that. I don't know if that's going to be in the first iteration, but I know that that is something that we have got to be mindful of as we build an industry in New York. Um, part of the work before us is that we are trying to start an industry, but we've got to make sure that we are leveling the playing field initially. Um, and if we have a micro business model that is completely geared toward a national growth plan, we might be squeezing out the people we really want while only creating a path for others. Um, so I think that as we're initially starting, we wanna keep it constrained the way it is currently in the law so that we really are affording opportunity and space for those new entrepreneurs, our growing entrepreneurs, those who do not have multi-state footprints to um, secure their space here. And I think that really just answered one of my other questions about that whole concept is that we do want to give as much room and as much space as possible to the entrepreneurs from marginalized communities, from marginalized groups that have been adversely affected by the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. so that's wonderful. And I know that there's a lot of different components in the social equity program to support them. Yes, yeah, so we're really excited about what we're doing in New York State. We were really clear that we were not going to pass legalization without expungement and um, addressing the, the records that many people are burdened with before they can return back to society and fully participate. I just want to say, like, we have had two real announcements that came out of our um, state of the state yesterday. Governor Hochul announced, one, that our tuition assistance would be available to those who have been formally incarcerated. We, that our um, 
that they can, well, she didn't announce it in the statement, but it is part of the state of the state plan. We're launching a $200 million fund so that we can support our equity applicants with access to capital. We're really looking at ways in which we help people transition back. Our expungement process is moving along. We have affected 400,000 New Yorkers since 2019. In 2019, we passed um, the ceiling portion in our decrim bill. We touched 200,000 people. Since March of 2021, we've touched an additional 200,000 people and we're not done yet. So I think that we're doing some of the things that's really gonna be necessary to get people access. And as you mentioned, we at OCM, with the CCB are tasked with putting structures in place to support our small businesses, our new businesses, our social equity applicants with technical assistance, financial planning, and just regular business assistance as they're moving forward. This excites us because this is how we build an industry. Mm -hmm. The larger players don't need us to um, participate. Our newer entrants to the business do our newer, smaller businesses, our businesses that are, growing in that are growing their capacity. And that will be the folks that are hiring 25, 50, 100 people locally. Those are the businesses that need us. And we're really excited that we have actually been mandated to support them. So this is, this is a new phase for New York State and we're excited to be a part of it. And I think we're the only state that has mandated such a thing into the cannabis program. Is that right? I think so. Um, I'm not going to say no, that people aren't trying to build it out or that they're not doing it at this moment, but I think that we're the only ones that were mandated. And I think that's what's exciting about New York. Um, and I think that we have an opportunity to be the leader in this moment to say a healthy um, industry is only the industry that allows all of the participants to participate fully. Um, we don't exclude others in other industries. We, so we've got to make sure that we're building cannabis in a way that really says, you know what, you want to participate. Here's a way for you to do it. Here's a way for you to grow your business. And if you decide that you want to stay kind of small and cre create work for yourself and maybe five or six other people, you can do it. But if you're also looking at how do you build an, in, um, an industrial center and you're going to hire 200 people, we want to be able to have a pathway for that too. Um, and I think we need all of it in New York State. That's amazing. And it, it seems like Governor Hochul and Lieutenant Governor Benjamin have been really, really supportive of the OCM for the <clears throat> project. They are. And I'm going to say I was so happy when Governor Hochul um, was sworn in and immediately she took the task up of assigning members to the control board. And then she got us up and started so that we can start hiring people. Um, the fact that our fund is part of the state of the state is, uh, it's just amazing. I really think that those are the types of um, supports that we need and we, the signals that the um, New Yorkers need to see and know and understand. That's a big deal for us to be able to go out and do a public private partnership to raise funds so that we can actually give loans to people before we start to collect taxes. Like that's that's one of the biggest hurdles. People wanted to know where is the money gonna come from? This is where we're gonna get the money from. And largely that means we're getting it from the private um, market. We are planning 150 million from um, private investments and only 50 million from taxes and revenue. So that gives us a lot of flexibility. It means that we can really get folks on the ground ready to operate as soon as licensing is available. That's amazing. And it also sounds like that might be a pathway toward keeping the actual product more affordable, which has been a big problem elsewhere. It does keep it. As soon as your costs are lower, you can sell for a lower price. Um, so, and the fact that it's a closed market, it's only here in New York, like you can't go across state lines. So I think we're also going to be able to keep a number of our purchasers buying here in New York state. Because you know everyone around us is has a legalized market as well, so we really have got to find a way so that our consumers are shopping in New York. Cool. When well, and you've already talked so much about your excitement with the expungement program, which I I can feel through this. <laughs> um, 
what I mean, do you see that as as being a gateway toward greater overall prison reform in the state? And is that I do. And I think that that's probably why it's exciting and why that was one of the focus, or I should say foci, is that the right plural of focus of, of the <laughs> legislature when they discussed and was considering the first versions of a legalization bill, that there could be no legalization if we were leaving people out who are suffering under laws that criminalize something that we're no longer criminalizing. Um, I think that that was the linchpin for many people that the work that we were doing was about restoring people and about restoring communities. Um, someone recently asked, what does it mean to have been harmed? And I think that we've got to remember and develop language so that we consistently bring home the point that what was done, the harm that was done was greater than just having someone arrested. It was a, the loss of innocence. It's the constant terror. It's trauma that people have experienced. It's the weight and burden that families and communities have carried because of this um, um, prohibition on cannabis. And so the war on drugs affected us in a lot of ways and it normalized activities that in no way should have ever been normalized. And now we have an opportunity to right those wrongs and to bring attention to the harms that have been done. So I think that that's a very large shifting the paradigm, shifting language and helping people to understand that that is just really not acceptable behavior for government is I think part of the biggest lift and some of the most exciting work that we're engaged in. Well, and I think you you hit it on the head with the that it's all about harm and how do we mitigate that harm. Uh, there are so many other provisions within the MRTA that I think a lot of people don't even think about as being part of that. But the provisions for parental custody, the provisions for being able to home grow. Um, you know, I, we, we do a lot with people that are involved in the NYC Cannabis Industry Association, and they're working on a project that would allow NYCHA to, to have rooftop gardens in their buildings. So, so I know that we've I've, um, had the opportunity to read some of their literature, and I think that that is exactly the type of work that we need community to be engaged in. So I oftentimes say the agency, the OC and the, C, the CCB has a mandate and our job is to do that work. Um, but we're very supportive of our community engaging and having the broader conversation. And we are very much engaged in supporting their efforts to make sure that consumption, um, possession is safe for all New Yorkers. We know that a large number of our um, federal counterparts, our political counterparts, as well as those in um, agencies working in um, the federal government are very much attuned to this concern. And I know that we have recently had, we have a new HUD um, director here in the New York City area that is also very much attuned to this work and concerned about the safety of people who live in any housing, not even just NYCHA. So section eight is captured um, in our many of our affordable housing units that people might not otherwise think about. Um, it's not simply NYCHA, but it's all encompassing. And we've got to make sure that they're safe in their homes when they are utilizing cannabis products um, that have been essentially normalized and legalized in this state. But for some reason on the very small plots of land that they're living on or their homes are, that they're susceptible to harm. So but I know that we've been supportive. We've seen some of the language. We are um, hoping that they get some traction um, with our federal counterparts and we are here to support the endeavors. Amazing. I have a quick question, <clears throat> just back to kind of the war on drugs and impacted communities. What has been your personal experience? I mean, <clears throat> you know, when you were growing up, like, is this something that you witnessed? Um, so I'm from Brooklyn, New York. So I've lived here my entire life and I've definitively um, experienced it. I am, I'm gonna say that you could not be black in New York City without experiencing it almost. It is going outside or walking home and knowing that you needed to be guarded and prepared 
for an, inter an unwanted police interaction. It is watching friends that may have just gone to the park to play ball being swept up um, by the police into police vans on any given day and then held at police stations for in some amount and who knows unknown amounts of time just because it was sweeps and there was a an op there was opportunity for New York City police officers to hopefully capture somebody that might have a little bit of marijuana on them. It's being patted down against walls. It's seeing people thrown up against um, surfaces. It's it's the loss of innocence for young people. It's terror and it's an ongoing trauma. It was living in a police state and that it had been normalized. It is 20 years of us watching um, a TV show that many of us loved, Law and Order, where things were normalized and you can't name five roles by black men on the, or Hispanic men that were not the criminal or the target of the investigation. It's 20 years of that. And so I think that those things framed it for me. And as soon as I was elected as an assembly member in 2016, the first person who came to my office um, with a request and it was, a, I wasn't even um, sworn in yet, was a friend who said, Tremaine, you're going to Albany. This is what you've got to work on. And it was about the de decriminalization of marijuana, but more importantly, it was about removing the criminal charges from people who had been picked up for holding low amount, small amounts of marijuana because it disrupts so much of their life thereafter. So it was really about figuring out ways for us to reintegrate people into our society and allow them to participate fully. Um, I think that's the work that we've all got to be involved in. And I always wonder, <clears throat> you know, talking to friends and hearing these stories like intimately, how does that even, you know, psychologically speaking, like the generations of how long does it even take to heal or repair or fix, you know, because even- I don't if that I couldn't answer. I just don't know that. I, I too don't know that answer because I think that there are um, habits that people are taught so that they can, um, by their parents or other loved ones in their lives, so that they can consistently protect themselves. So there's a hardening that must happen so that people can navigate such a space. There is so that they are prepared for what might occur. And that ends up shaping their interactions with one another, their outlook on what to expect from service, from people who are supposed to be service providers. It builds expectations and to redirect and reimagine those expectations will take time. It's like asking us, how long does it take for those who went and served in Vietnam to come back and be fully restored? And I don't know that answer. I don't know if they're ever fully restored. Um, so we have a population and a generation of people who have got to reassociate and they are still teaching lessons. So what are the lessons that they're teaching and how are people reinterpreting that? Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I have, you know, obviously it's January 6th, so it's a year mm -hmm. of anniversary. <laughs> The insurrection. So, I mean, I think obviously this touches on a lot of what you just described. If you wanted to give us some comments or, I mean, I think all of us can agree the level of ridiculousness surrounding it is beyond. But uh, yeah, what do you have to kind of phrase or paraphrase? <laughs> I'm going to say that I am very happy that the work before me is focused on <laughs> New York State and our cannabis industry. Um, and that I am going to leave the work of examining and exploring and investigating the January 6th insurrection to the folks in the federal government. I am, I know that my plate is full and I am very much committed to using my energy and resources to build out cannabis in New York state. I understand that there are lots of other competing interests around us. I and the OCM, cannot tackle all of them, but we have work in front of us that is serious, that is impactful, and that that's really what we wanna see. We wanna build relationships. We wanna build this industry. We wanna make sure people have access and access to capital. Amazing. 
And um, also, since this is going to be a Black History Month themed issue, what are your thoughts on Black History Month? Or are there any um, comments that you want to make that uh, you haven't seen people really talking about with it? So you know what, I think Black History Month is America's moment to um, look at itself. It's a moment to look in the mirror. It is, while it is a celebration of the accomplishments of Black Americans who have been um, innovative, they've been um, tenacious, and they've always approached problem solving with a hopefulness. This is our moment to celebrate that. But I also think that it's the moment for America to look in the mirror and to assess how all of these accomplishments have occurred under conditions that have been less than beneficial, less than supportive, and to sort of reckon with ourselves of how do we correct some of that. Um, I never fool myself into thinking that we're erasing it, but I do believe that we're constantly making steps to better the situation. And I hope that the work that we're doing um, in cannabis in New York State can be considered a part of that work of consistently moving the dial forward to create a more humane, a more um, supportive space for Blacks in America. Well, and let's just talk timelines really quickly because in October, the goal was to have licenses by 2023. And now it seems like the the date has sped up a little bit. So we're sticking to the 18 months. I know that people hate when I say it, but we're sticking to 18 months. That's that's our timeline. But even just like with all work, if we can beat the timeline, we will. We are steadily pushing forward and we're hopeful that we can issue the first draft of our regulations in hopefully by the end of this first quarter, maybe the beginning of the second quarter. And that would be a, um, in advance of sort of our 18 month timeline schedule, but it's hopeful. It hasn't happened yet. We are steadily pushing, we are working towards it, but we're gonna stick with the 18 months, but we're gonna pray that we beat it. Cool. <laughs> well, um, I think those were all the questions that I had, although if there is anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to mention, we are all ears. Uh, no, I think that we've kind of touched on all of it. Um, so yeah, I, think I guess I had a couple, just two quick follow-ups. Um, you know, um, aside from what we spoke about for your, you know, department, um, is there anything kind of you want to see emerge or that hasn't come to you know public discourse yet um, from your the department and what can the possibility? Um, so I guess I don't want to put the cart before the horse, <laughs> but I'm going to say I am truly hopeful that we are treating all of cannabis, that all of cannabis ultimately comes together for um, under the OCM so that we can really treat it um, like one industry. I think that it, it will be helpful to the market for us to really, um, to be able to do that. While we have great relationships with our other agencies, I just think that it becomes easier for our consumers if they know that they're going one place. It's one stop shopping for all of cannabis. Um, so that is like down the road and in the future, but I would love to see that. And I guess I'm really excited and I really want to see New Yorkers think boldly about cannabis and what it could be in this, um, in this marketplace. I think there's a lot of conversation about retail dispensaries. And I just know that we have such creative people here in New York State that if people start to think a little more broadly, we'll see great innovation and we'll see new product lines that folks are not thinking about. And I, I would really love to see New York leading the way. And do you plan to stay in politics for a long time? Like, So I'm gonna say this job is political, it's an appointment. Um, I really do enjoy this work. 
I love the idea of helping to shape this new industry in New York State. I, um, I'm a lawyer by training. I've worked um, in corporate as well at, or I should say in transactional as well as in litigation, but it's always been corporate work. Um, I owned a small business. I really do enjoy the un, like understanding what is going on in our marketplace and how we get to shape it. Um, so for me, if the OCM and CCB will have me, I will stay here and serve. Um, but I was gonna say nothing is promised and I have three years to work on building the best industry here in New York state. And so I really wanna see people with strong businesses that can, st can sustain uh, market trends, ups and downs, that we have a marketplace that can um, pivot when we go national and that we are doing fantastic innovative things. So if I can help build that, I'm gonna, I was gonna say there's nothing more that I could ask for. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then finally for me is, um, do you, have you met Dishita Dawson? Yep, I have, yes. So she's wonderful as we all know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, lately she's been really speaking, um, you know, out about cannabis as the whole plant, like you were describing, but also as a disruptor for pharmaceuticals and, and you know, these larger things that I think would be so good for the rest of the, um, the planet, really. But I mean, I suppose that's more of a federal thing, like in order to. So some of that is federal and some of it is under the mandate of OCM. We are charged with doing research, and I believe that our research should be supportive of innovation in the market. Yeah. And part of that work will be to understand what's going on within our endocannabinoid system so that people can understand how this plant and all of its attributes are able to support our natural um, biological systems. Then we also have the opportunity to think about what are the better industrial uses of this plant and also how do we manufacture so that people can access this very easily that's part of our mandate research is in it we have a research arm we do have um, we've just hired the um, department lead in that um, space so we're really excited about what's going to come out of it I think that very often when we think about controlled substances, the research is on like prevention and telling kids no, we have that responsibility, but we also need to have a fuller, um, broader perspective so that we understand that this is, an, this is a moment of opportunity for us. It's not simply a, um, a means to say, it's not simply to reinforce conversations that already exist. It's really about exploring new opportunities. Yeah, like an evolution. Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, we both really appreciate your time. And as Jamie said, this is a Black History Month issue and we've got Wiz Khalifa on the cover. Oh, we're super so excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ricky Williams, we're going to be talking to him because, um, you know, Super Bowl is next month yes. and everything. Um, so, you know, any activations, we have a lot of um, Black writers and just writers from all different, you know, backgrounds, and we'd love to cover anything that you guys have going on during the month or anything through the city. So I guess we could reach out to your PR team as well. Thank that. you. Thank you so much. Um, I am really appreciative of this opportunity and thank you for giving me um, a space today. And also, I want to say thank you for mentioning us in, I think you met your previous issue. Or freedom um, in the yeah. OCM. Yes, thank you. Um, so hopefully one day we'll get a cool um, shot like you have of Jamie and Marley too. No. <laughs> right? Yeah. I, we can all go to the, there's the, you know, the jam, jam rock cruise that goes to Jamaica. We can do it there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's in our budget, but <laughs> maybe we go to Jamaica Bay. <laughs> Honey Circle sponsors. <laughs> No, but it, that's wonderful. So I do want to say, I do want to applaud you on sort of the layout and the way it reads. I really like it. It's a very um, difficult market to be print these days. I realize that. So kudos. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we can send you some of our past issues too. You might like it. We always try to have like an educational slant, you know, to the okay. content. So yes, yes. Yeah. And, and your, I think the issue I was um, looking at was um, 
there were like a few articles on the um, Last Prisoner Project. And some and a professor that I was just talking with at um, the Syracuse Business School, he's using some of that and he's profiling them and some of the work for his MBA students. So it was just a good um, good resource for them too. Thanks. Oh, good. Yeah, we do a lot more and more, not just cannabis related with prison reform. And, um, you know, we have one of our close colleagues was born in prison and mm -hmm. went back to prison. So she's always like, you know, we like to hear from inmates and just the atrocities of the criminal justice system and overall are something we try to address as much as possible because it's kind of like overwhelmingly bad, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so. That's so, tough. and I, so I, it resonates the innocence project was kind of just picking up when I was in law school. So something that I'd learned about then. And so it's very similar work. It's, okay. Yeah, it's, I was going to say the, the idea, the premise. And so they're going at in the Innocence Project. They're going after um, to reverse the convictions of people who had been falsely imprisoned. And it could be because people lied or because there was no DNA or maybe it was just a situation where, um, speaking of Black History Month, where it was a case where, you know, it was a Black defendant, an entirely white jury, no evidence, but they were still found guilty. So there's a lot of those kind of projects that they were working on too. And so we've seen great success for them over the past 20 years. And so I believe the Last Prisoners Project is working in the same vein. Yeah, they have a great team, um, but you know, we're working with someone now who is in Mississippi and was charged twice for the same, so federal and state for the same crime. And double yeah, double jeopardy. So he served 20, he's on a second 20 year term so i don't know i was gonna say it's a lot it's a lot of work to be done in this space um reform is not easy and it, it, it's always a heavy lift um but i think that we all have sort of a a small part to play in it we just got to figure out how we do our portion well um but it's unfortunately slow moving but it's a steady grind it is a steady grind and um, the lift in lungs are not lifting alone. We'll actually get it done, but it's, it's slow and steady work. Yeah, that's a good point. Just to keep going. And the more we amass together, mm -hmm. the more change can occur. Yep. I was gonna say, we need people who write about it, who talk about it, who are in the courtrooms, people who um, inform others about it. Some, I, we need the busybody in the neighborhood who just talks because she tells 18 different people. Like we need all of that, honestly, because that's the only way sort of the, the ship starts to shift direction and yeah. we're gonna change course. Um, but there is a role for everybody. It's slow moving. I was saying I own um, a small business. I had a coffee shop for almost 10 years. The block that I was on was me, a corner store, the weed spot, a gambling spot, and like nothing else. And now it's sort of the hub of activity in my neighborhood. It oh, is, wow. It's taken 15 so years. It's taken 15 years. Oh, so I can say work is slow. And sometimes the one thing you're doing, you don't even think that it's going to have a rippling effect the way it does. Um, but we were just holding space, I'm imagining and creating the environment for other people to think that they could come. And so sometimes it just happens that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, that's reassuring. You know, we're definitely committed and we get <clears throat> a ton of inquiries because I don't think there's a lot of places for inmates to even have a voice to tell their stories. You know, they don't have anyone to talk to as you probably know a lot of times. So. Mm -hmm you know, we try as much as we can to share. Um, I think that's probably what the best. But you were saying about um, Governor Hochul's oh, yeah, initiative. She created an advisory team, or she is in the process of creating an advisory team to explore clemency um, in the state. And while we are not sitting on, New York State only, we don't have anybody actually that's being held on um, marijuana charges at this point. Um, but I think that the model is something that's worth having a conversation about. And um, so she'll be able to explore things that are outside of cannabis and just in thinking about the way we reform um, considerations on 
clemency generally. I think that this is one of those um, issues. So she's gonna do that so that clemency will be a consideration throughout the year versus just in December. I see. Which is typically the case, yeah. We'd love to talk to her about that. Is she doing interviews? Do you know? I guess you could ask. Um, I don't know. So yeah. it was, I think she did it as part of her state of, I think it's in her state of the oh, state okay. um, book. And, but it was not mentioned during her speech. She, she gave a very short speech comparatively to what we've had in recent years. Um, but the book is like 200 pages and it has all of her policy proposals mm -hmm. and um, it's in there. So I don't know if she's doing interviews on it yet, but maybe once they start to um, identify members for the advisory mm -hmm. committee, it might be worth reaching out to have her speak on who she's appointing and what they're going to be doing and stuff. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask too, like, so, you know, some of the legacy brands are still participating. Like, how does that work? Is it just like, is no one talking, you know, and like, how does that? So one, <laughs> yes, we do have an enforce, enforcement mandate, but we're not beginning with enforcement. We would much prefer to have an opportunity to get people onboarded into a licensed, regulated market. And so that's really what we need people to do. We need legacy operators to prepare themselves to come over into the regulated market. Um, so we do not want to reinstitute a police state, mm -hmm. but what they're doing is actually illegal at the moment. And we don't control police. We only control the enforcement agents that will be hired. We don't even have them yet. That will be hired for the OCM. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you have any questions for us or anything? Um, nope. Okay. Not yet. Um, no, I think that's everything. Okay. Well, you know, thank, Dan, please, you know, think of us as a resource if you hear of, you know, any stories or people that want to share their stories or anything to get out there. Um, yeah, we work with, you know, mentorship programs and students from the universities and people from all different areas and, and stuff and, yeah, law students and everything. So everyone's very much okay. interested in what we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, sorry. One quick thing I forgot. I was asked, requested. So there were, they're starting a female-led incubator here in Manhattan for plant-based brands, um, like a co-working exercise place, and they wanted to be in touch with you to kind of invite you or, or have you visit the, the grounds, like when it's up and running. So I just wanted to see if it was okay if we would extend invitations to you for that it's like a cannabis yeah. okay okay yes definitely okay cool definitely and I think that that's also indicative of sort of the way we need people to be thinking everybody's not going to go and be a cultivator yeah um, but there's going to be a lot of ancillary businesses that support the industry and this is exactly in that that um vein of businesses yeah they um, wanted yeah like female executives or startups yeah, mm -hmm. they call it, they're calling it the greenhouse, which is kind of cool, like H-A-U-S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> All okay. right. Yes, please. Let me know. I would love to show up. Okay. Thanks, Tremaine. All right. Thank you. Bye, Jamie. Bye-bye.